We got two great people here tonight to talk. Janine uh, Di Giovanni has written for Vanity Fair, New York Times, Granta, Newsweek, and uh, I mean, she's reported on wars in Africa, the Middle East, uh, the subcontinent, uh, uh, Kosovo, uh, uh, the Balkans. I mean, um, I can't believe, uh, Janine, that you were in Grozny when it fell. That was one of those wars that I looked at and thought, God, are there any good guys in this thing? Uh, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Jim Frederick uh, is also gonna be up here on the stage. He was international editor for Newsweek and he wrote a great book called Black Hearts, One Platoon's Descent into Madness in Iraq's Triangle of Death. Uh, this is a benefit for uh, risk, reporters instructed in saving colleagues uh, and all the money uh, raised tonight goes to support the program that uh, Sebastian Younger and my daughter Lily are running to train war correspondents uh, in first aid, battlefield first aid, and give them medical kits. Um, actually, this is the uh, medical kit that they're given after a, a very rigorous four-day uh, training program, which is usually done here in New York at the Bronx Documentary Center. Uh, but I understand they're trying to do one in uh, Istanbul this year. Because um, there are a lot of journalists in Turkey right now. Um, and actually, uh, the slideshow that you're going to be seeing uh, is work by Nicole Tung, who's here in the, in the front row. And uh, it includes uh, some photos from last week's uh, protest uh, in Istanbul. So uh, pretty fresh uh, stuff. And her boyfriend on the crutches there got hurt uh, during the uh, protest in Istanbul. Um, and we want to thank uh, Together uh, for helping us uh, 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 sell the tickets and uh, arrange tonight. And uh, Meg, our events manager, Aaron, uh, the uh, space manager here, and my daughter Lily. I, I'm Steve Hindi. I'm, I'm uh, president of Brooklyn Brewery, and I used to be a foreign correspondent. Uh, that's the connection. <laughs> now, when I tell my wife I'm on the way to the airport, uh, uh, she usually knows where I'm headed. Uh, so, uh, so Jim and uh, Janine, you want to come up here? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, welcome, everyone. Thanks to Brooklyn Brewery, uh, to Risk, and to Together, and Janine to, to be here. I'm sorry that Bob couldn't make it, but it's true. Foreign correspondents get called off at a moment's notice. And he warned me that he might be going to Iran, um, but Hong Kong, I guess, uh, took precedence. So, um, and in the, um, you know, strictest traditions of journalistic fact-checking. I, I, I do need to point out that despite that beautiful introduction, uh, I've had a 16-year association working for Time, not Newsweek. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, it's, we still refer to it as Brand X, so it's one of the last real blood feuds left in journalism, and so. Um, but other than that, it was perfect. Uh, anyhow. Um, so yeah, we're here to, we're here to talk about uh, journalism and the life of a foreign correspondent and the costs and very often the personal costs. And so I'm really, really honored to be here with Janine who is a legend. Uh, and, and it's a great, great honor to be sharing the stage with her and to be having a conversation with her um, because she's really a dean of so many conflicts, and uh, I haven't known her personally until tonight, but I know so many networks of people that know her and revere her, and um, she's just really led the way. And um, so I'm, I'm really honored uh, to, to be here tonight uh, speaking with you. And so with that, I think that we'll just kick it off and we'll try to have a conversation. And after about an hour at about 9 o'clock, we'll open up uh, the floor to questions from the audience. And um, so I guess we'll just start in a very 
broad sense. Um, your first reporting conflict was the Intifada. Uh, and so you've been at this a while. And how has the industry, the game, the risks, uh, and the personal costs changed over that time as you've matured as an adult and, you know, had a kid and, and, and but, but how has the industry also changed and how, how do you see the landscape having changed since that, that first assignment? Um, can you hear? Is this, yeah. Um, this morning I had breakfast with a, a young woman who's a stringer um, living in Istanbul and she was asking me about the golden days of journalism, which is when we started, um, when you were basically given a packet of money by a news organization and told to go off and, and find a story. Um, and the luxury of having this was incredible, but the most important part of it was that you felt very protected. Um, and I think now the big difference is for freelancers and for stringers, um, and even for staff people, there is the protection, the safety net just isn't there the way it used to be. Um, I think the pressure on freelancers is so much heavier than it was um, when I started out. And I think then there was much more a sense of um, taking care. You know, I was told by editors, you know, don't do it if you think it's too difficult. And now I think um, certainly with the death of a very close friend of mine who died in Holmes, um, I think she had a lot, I'm, I don't want to give her name because I don't want to name her editor, but I think she had tremendous pressure from her organization to go into homes in, in Syria at a time when it was incredibly dangerous. And it was really pressure that, that drove her to it. Um, so I think that what's changed mainly is, of course, the budgets are hugely different. Journalism is shrinking. Um, newspapers have shrunk. Everything's online now. Um, so I think we, we have to adapt to that, but I still think that we, we have to continue doing stories that matter um, and long format journalism, narrative journal journalism, photojournalism projects. Um, and I think, you know, I think we have to keep it going somehow, but I think the main thing, and that's why I'm very happy to be speaking here tonight, is safety. And that's my biggest concern now, because I just feel like too many reporters are left on their own to go out and uh, report, especially Syria, which is a, a very dangerous conflict. So what do you think has caused major news organizations and major news brands to be, I don't want to put words in your mouth either, to maybe be more cavalier than they were before about the, say, is it something about the proliferation of online competition or that there are more people who will work for free or close to free than there used to be? What are the multi-form reasons for why this might be going this way? Well, you know, I think that some editors feel that why should you pay a, a seasoned reporter who wants insurance and, and you, you reach a certain stage of your life and your career and you, you don't want to work for peanuts and you want insurance um, to back you. You want to know if you break your leg or if you get hurt that you're going to get looked after. Um, and in a sense, there are so many stringers that will do your job if you can't that I think editors are taking this very cavalier look at it. Um, whereas I, I feel like there was more loyalty. I'm not looking at things in a, in a kind of rose-colored way and saying the past was great. And it's not just that. I just think that um, there, the wars have gotten increasingly more dangerous. Um, kidnapping for me was never really on the agenda until Grozny, um, Syria, um, Chechnya. That was the first time that I went to report a conflict and it wasn't just shelling and bombing I was worried about, it was, it was kidnapping. But I can remember um, an editor of mine on a, a major magazine here who didn't want to give me kidnap K&R insurance, kidnap and ransom insurance, because he said it turns you into a walking ATM machine. Um, ATM distributor machine. So I, I think that um, now in Syria, just this week, two good friends of mine, French journalists, Didier Francois from Europe, um, one were, were kidnapped. And it's, it's becoming a, a business. You know, it, mm. opportunistic guys set up at checkpoints and take journalists and that's it. So it's right. much more of a, it's not just a random thing now. It's more strategic. Well, th this came up a lot probably for journalists 
starting at least in my consciousness with the Iraq War. Yeah. Um, but but over your, the arc of your career, do you find a difference in terms of the combatants? I mean, there we're, you know, I, I worked in Japan for several years, so there were some people still running around who worked the Vietnam War, and they talked about how, you know, even the Viet Cong would, you could go to the other side, and they would respect your status as a journalist, and you know, you could go basically embed with the Viet Cong for weeks because they thought that you would be instrumental in getting their story out. Do you, you notice a fundamental disrespect or lack of that sanctity of the, the journalist moniker with the combatants themselves? Yeah, I, I think that um, certainly in Syria, it's um, you either report one side or the other. And that's largely, I think, the, the fault of the, the government, the regime, who don't give out visas to journalists um, easily. It's getting a bit looser now, but it's, it's very tough. So, I mean, journalists have basically the choice of trying to report it from Lebanon or going through Turkey illegally. And once you do go through Turkey, um, you more or less have, have blotted your copybook um, with the regime if they find out that you're, you're working on that side. Um, I remember in the Bosnian War, it was quite similar that you, you, most of us stayed in Sarajevo and reported the war from that side because it was a human story and it was very much a, a civilian story. Um, but there were journalists who stayed in Belgrade and they, they often said that we were biased because we were in Sarajevo and we were, um, writing about the horror of the siege and, and how people were affected by the bombardment. But in fact, um, we couldn't go to Belgrade either. I mean, once you sort of chose a side, that was it. And so I think it, it I think the Vietnam War was pretty much the last one that you could cover both sides mm -hmm. that easily. Since we're here to talk so much about safety uh, and so many people look up to you, um, take us back when you first started you know, risk didn't exist, and how did one who was a brand new journalist then being plunged headlong into a conflict zone, how did you train up? How did you know to stay, like, who taught you how to stay safe? I was such an idiot. I mean, I really, I had no clue. <laughs> I just, I kind of turned up in Jerusalem and there were, you know, all these veteran Middle East correspondents, and the Middle East is a place that you really, you feel so insecure if you don't, you know, have vast knowledge of, of the history of the region and speak the language. And, and I just kind of rolled up there and I had no journalistic experience. I just finished graduate school. Um, <laughs> Can I say, why did you go in the first place? I went in the first place because I, um, I'd finished my, my thesis and I pulled out a newspaper one day and there was an article about a lawyer, um, a Jewish lawyer, um, who had been a Holocaust survivor who defended Palestinians in military court. And I read it and I just thought that she sounded like the most heroic person I had ever read about. And I, I don't, it was just a, a pull. And I found her and I went to meet her and she brought me into her whole, she was a communist and she, um, she was in this whole world of the, the anti-occupation movement, but yet she was an Israeli who loved her country. Um, and I went to interview her and I basically just stayed. And I was very lucky. I ended up getting a book deal for absolutely no money and I just stayed and she brought me into her world. But I think, I always say the first time I walked into a refugee camp, mm -hmm. it was just my life changed forever. And I just mm -hmm. couldn't, I couldn't go back to the world I wanted to live in, which was academia and marriage and two kids and you know, mm -hmm. a little house. It just, it wasn't gonna happen. Mm -hmm. um, but your original question about safety. I mean, the big thing then during the first intifada, I mean, the worst thing that could ha happen to you is that you would get either shot at a demonstration with a rubber bullet accidentally. Um, I don't think at that point the Israeli army was deliberately targeting journalists, which it, <laughs> that would come later. Um, or getting hit by a rock, because the, the Shabab were throwing rocks at your car. So that was probably the worst. But I remember hitchhiking to Gaza, like literally just, right. you know, going everywhere by myself, I never thought, it never even entered my mind about um, getting raped. I mean, it, 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 it was, I think I was so innocent that in a way <laughs> that must have protected me because I was fine. And then um, I was lucky that there were 
people that took me under their wing. And no one taught me how to behave at a demonstration or you know, how to deal with tear gas or something like that, but I, you learn very fast. And I think the, the main thing is you develop your intuition. Mm -hmm. And so very quickly, by the time the Bosnian war, war rolled around, which was 92, um, I would get a sense when I was on a road if it was bad or not. And, mm -hmm. um, and I always say to young reporters, I think that your intuition comes in time, but you really have to listen to it and pay attention mm -hmm. and you know, go with what you feel. And if you're afraid of something, there's absolutely no dishonor in saying, I'm not going. Right. You know, you just, you have to stick with that. And how often does it happen that you get in groups of journalists, because sometimes it's more expedient or necessary to travel in packs, that your intuition has held you back when, you know, the, the, the rush to be first and the rush to get the scoop, I mean, the peer pressure among journalists can also be intense. Have you had cases where you have said, I'm hanging back on this one, guys? I do now, um, now that I have a kid, but I think in my earlier years, I was, I was the one that would kind of push my, um, my <laughs> the people I was working with to kind of, let's go for it. And it's interesting, um, some of them, we worked together beautifully and we would agree, now is the right time to go or now is not the right time to go or it's too dangerous to go. Um, but once I had a child, it changed drastically. And I remember I, um, I had a fight with someone I worked with for years and years and years, um, Alex Maioli, who's a great friend of mine and is now the president of Magnum. And uh, we were in Karachi and we were supposed to go on a raid with the police um, in a house of jihadis. But it was our last day in Karachi and we had done a really good story. Um, I felt that we had gotten everything we needed. We just, we had done it. And I, I, it was time to go and we were leaving that night. And the police said to us, do you want to go on this raid? You know, we're going on it in 10 minutes. And I said, no, I don't need it. And Alex got so angry at me. He said, you have to turn into a bourgeois French housewife. Uh -huh. and, you know, and I was like, he's like, what's happened to you? And I was like, you know, I, it's, a, it's a sentence in my story. Uh -huh. um, I said, you can go, you go, but I just don't need it. And um, I didn't regret it. And, and afterwards, we found out that during that raid, three, three cops had been killed. And um, mm. I think, you know, I know it's really cliche, but once I had a child, it was that I, it, it wasn't about me anymore. Um, before, it was basically that I always thought, well, if, if something happens to me, if I die, at least I die believing in what I do. And if anything, I've always been very passionate a, about my work. And so if you die believing in something, that, that's not bad. Right. But then when I had a kid, it, it changed forever because it was uh, about someone else. Well, let's talk about that a little bit more. When, when did you have your kid? How do you negotiate how long you allow yourself to be away for? How often you can extend a trip if the story requires it? How often do you push back on an editor saying, I have responsibilities other than this job? Just talk a little bit more about how your life changed in that way and, well, um, for lack of a better word, you know, compromises that you need to make to have a, a 360 degree life. It's really hard. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's an enormous kind of juggling act. Um, and anyone, I, I've seen some women um, reporters say that there's no difference between men and women, and I just think that's such bullshit. I mean, uh, really, it's well, just... I, I want to split that question in two then, because I want to come back to this. I mean, you mentioned rape, so I want to come back to the safety issue. Yeah. After then, if there's no difference between men and women, talk about family responsibilities in, that, in those terms as well. Um, I, I mean, I waited very long to have a baby, because basically I think for most women, your career trajectory um, takes off when you're in your late 20s and 30s. So it just wasn't the time for me to stop and take two years off, which is what I wanted to do when I had a kid. Um, so I waited to like the last possible moment, which I really wouldn't advise to anyone, but I did. Um, <laughs> and I had a beautiful little boy and everything was fine. But I, can, I will never forget telling my foreign editor that I was pregnant. And it was the most extraordinary thing. I worked for the Times of London for many, many years. And he was a man who had six children. And when I told him, I mean, I waited, I was about four months pregnant, maybe, and it was after the fall of um, Baghdad. Um, 
And I remember going into his office and saying, you know, listen, Martin, um, I, I'm, I'm pregnant, so I can't, uh, I can't keep going back and forth to Baghdad anymore. And he said, he turned white, and he just, he, I, I'll never forget it, because he was so angry, and he said, I've got a war correspondent who can't go to war. And I said, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm a writer, I'm a journalist, I'm not a war correspondent. It's not in my contract. And then he just said, he was just so angry. I, and I finally said to him, you know, if I were you, I'd be really careful, because this country, Britain, has very strict laws about um, pregnant women, um, the protection of, of women who are pregnant. And he was getting really into the kind of like legal aspect of it. And I never forgot that because he just, after that he completely ignored me. It was like he couldn't cope with, he could cope with me as a woman reporter, but he couldn't cope with me as someone who was pregnant. And I'll never forget it. He kind of left me alone until my son was two months old. And then he kind of phoned me gleefully and said, um, okay, party's over, time to go back to Baghdad. And I was, I was just like, you bastard. But I, I, I went, and it was the most horrific experience because I had to leave my two-month-old baby at home. And it was August, and you know, you know, nothing happened in August. And it was the same week that Bezlan in Chechnya happened. So I was completely knocked off the, you know, the foreign pages. And I was sitting in Baghdad. It was the worst. It was 2004, so that really nasty time. And... Um, having to go out every day to Sadr City and report with, and, and I had changed so radically um, from a year before, from the woman I was before than the person I was when I had this kid, because I was like, I don't want to get shot, I don't want to get blown up by a car bomb, um, and I was very overly cautious on that trip. Um, and I remember there was, I was working with a colleague who was um, a woman hater, a real woman hater, and <laughs> He, I was coming downstairs and I heard him say to someone really happily, she's lost her nerve. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I have, and that's okay. Uh -huh. You know, I'm a normal human being now. Right. So, so do, you, do you now... <laughs> <laughs> um, would you say that you, you take assignments that are um, a much more defined term of time and that, you know, when the first day of school happens, you need to be there? Yeah. Is that something that's just much more ever-present? That I, I only go, I mean, my maximum is 10 days, and I'll, I'll push it to two weeks if I have to, but that's, um, I, you know, I, I wrote about this in my book, but I, the best mothering advice came from an Iraqi politician, came from Ahmed Chalabi, who said to me during that, that awful trip, he said, like, where's your baby? And I said, um, he's at home, and he said, you know what? There will always be another war, but Luca's yeah. first tooth, his first, the first time he walks, the first birthday party, if you miss that, you will never forgive yourself. And I just thought, wow. Um, and it's very funny, because his daughter later said to me, it's really interesting my dad told you that, because he was never around when we were growing up. <laughs> but um, I just saw so many of my colleagues really regret not being around when their kids were small. Yeah. And so I basically, you know, I. I really put my career totally on hold, yeah. and I just thought, I'm only gonna have one kid, yeah. and I've waited this long, and I, I wanna do it right. Yeah. Um, so I missed a lot of stuff, I missed a lot of stories, but you know, the terrible thing is that he was right. Um, there always is another war. Yeah. And so now when I do it, I'm much more, I'm much more cautious, um, I mean, I'll, I will do frontline stuff if I have to, but a lot of times I just think bang bang is so um, unnecessary. And I, there were times when I would do stories, when I was the only writer on a, the frontline with the photographers, and the, my colleagues would say, you know, do you really need to be there? Do you really need to be in a trench for 10 days? And, and I felt like I did, because I felt like I had to feel it to write about it. And I can't write about something unless, unless I feel passionately about it. Mm -hmm. That's my own flaw, but um, I went in Aleppo um, with Nicole and uh, Patty Wells in December, and we were making a documentary, and I was, you know, I felt very responsible for them and, and, and for me and for my son, and I, you know, I didn't want us to do things that, would, that we didn't need to do. Mm -hmm. And at times I think, you know, Nicole was very pissed off at me, but it's just, you know, I, I felt like, 
there are limits. It's dangerous enough that we're here. We put ourselves in great risk to get here. We're getting good stuff. Don't push it. And I've lost too many of my really close friends um, who were killed in, in, you know, either by, killed by rebel soldiers in conflicts or blown up by landmines or, or killed themselves because they were just so mess, messed up by, by war. That I just feel very lucky that I, I, I'm unscathed. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I, I really always stress this to reporters. You, know, you, you don't have to get the bang bang. There's so many other ways of reporting a war. Have you never suffered a physical conflict injury? Uh, I, I, I had a mock execution, which was really hairy, but they didn't, they didn't shoot me here. Um, they let us go after about five hours, but um, no, I, I've never, I've never, I've never been injured. Mm -hmm. I've never been, um, and so I almost don't want to say that. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, more to the, how do you, having done this for so long, how do you maintain psychological health and mental well-being? How do you manage the stresses that I think, you know, I've done a lot of work with the U.S. military and it's a long time coming for the military superstructure to acknowledge that PTSD is such a big problem and that mental health is such a big problem, uh, arguably even dwarfs many of the veterans' physical ailments. And, you know, being somebody who's been a lifelong journalist, I I'm not sure we've really come to terms in the same way. That I think a lot of journalists suffer from undiagnosed PTSD. So how do you, what's been your personal strategy for managing some, what could be a very serious toll? Um, I think, uh, I'm just gonna backtrack on that. I think it was about 1994 or 95, um, the BBC was the first news organization that made reporters come back from conflict and be debriefed and see a shrink and <clears throat> talk through what had happened to them. And around that time, um, a psychiatrist called Anthony Feinstein, who um, worked at the University of Toronto, started doing a survey on uh, a group of us. There was about, I think, 20 of us um, on the long-term effects of post-traumatic stress on reporters who cover war. And it took three years, and he basically took this group of us as a... Um, what you call it in psychology when you have a test group and and then he had a group of normal reporters who covered Control you know group. city politics and stuff and for three years he basically every time we would come back from somewhere we'd have to go through this session of how much we drank how many people we slept with <laughs> um, who how we um, assimilated back into normal life and he kept notes and it was it was um, in the end, he did a big paper for the American Journal of Psychiatry, and it was the first paper to ever come out. And then he wrote a book about it called Dangerous Lives, um, Men and Women Who Report War. And I'll never forget, like, when we had to go for our final consultation, um, he called me in and he said, you know, you don't, you don't have post-traumatic stress disorder. And I said, why not? <laughs> you know, <'cause>, like, <laughs> everyone else had it. And the list of what people had gone through was horrific. I mean, there was a lot of the African reporters were in, in this study group. And they had been in planes that had crashed and everyone was killed except them. There were people who had been, people who had been raped, people who had been badly beaten up. Um, but I think that, and I said to him, why don't I have it? And he said, um, it's genetic, like alcoholism. And you're a very resilient person. And after that, I began to study resilience and why some people are able to bounce back from situations and others aren't. And uh, I, I, I married someone who, who suffered from very severe post-traumatic stress. And um, I think that basically I was very lucky in that I, I would come back and I, my home environment was very important to me and I had a really close group of friends. I, I never talked about war with them. I mean, I felt like it was so phony to come back and live in, I lived in London, live in Notting Hill and bore people with war stories. I just never, I just wouldn't talk about it, which probably was strange, but I tried to keep as normal a life as I could manage. Um, and, but it, it was hard. And, and also, I, there was one point when the only people I really wanted to be with 
during the Bosnian War were people who knew what it was like. It was very hard for me to go to a dinner party with socialites in Mayfair or something and, and mm -hmm. hear them talk about clothes or parties or money and it just, it, I felt very alien. But, um, yeah. but no, I think, I think that some people are more resilient than others. I think that's the sad truth of yeah. it. Well, and as I said, we just met and I have more experience in assigning correspondence. I mean, I've done a couple of tours in Iraq, but it, just having met you tonight, it seems that you've reiterated several times that it was important to have a home life that was normal. It was important to go in and out. In my experience of assigning these correspondence, that there's um, journalists who go and they become addicted to the thrill and they become convinced that that's normal life and they can never go back to normal life. And so they just go down the rabbit hole and they never want to come back. Uh, and they just, they go, they stay too long at the rodeo and you know, they're just, they're there forever and it's very hard to pull them back. And as news organizations, we are probably culpable in that, that we don't get more interventionists, but you know, when it's so hard to get somebody to go to Baghdad or Karachi and they want to stay, great. That's another thing I don't need to worry about for three months is who the, who the correspondent is going to be while there. But um, I think that's a pretty crucial difference that it sounds to me like you've always been very clear that this is work and this is life and work and life are not the same thing. And even before I had a kid or, or I, you know, um, I was involved with anyone. I mean, I just, I knew that when I came home to Notting Hill, that was my, my flat and my life and my books and my friends and my, and it was really important for me to, to get back into the world. But also, I never liked getting shot at. <laughs> I, mean, I, no, I mean, I think there are, there are reporters, definitely, and we, we know who they are, who, who like, who, the adrenaline is so important to them. And I would always say, like, go bungee jumping, you know, mm -hmm. do something that, but to me, I hated the feeling of being stuck in the back of a Jeep and there's a battle raging and you're driving down a road. I mean, I'd be like cowering in the back seat, but I, um, you know, I had a reputation as being very um, strong in, in those, and I, and I was, but I, I never liked um, bombing or, I mean, I remember when I went to Chechnya, um, I called Miguel uh, Di Moreno, who was killed, murdered in Sierra Leone with Kurt Schork in um, May of 2000 and, Two, I think. And he said to me, um, getting into Grozny was the most difficult thing I've ever done, you know, hiking over mountains. And, and he said, be sure when you're there to ask the Chechens that you want to leave at least 10 days before you crack, because it will take them 10 days to organize and get you out. And he said, and the, the shelling will drive you to the point of madness. And um, and I thought, you know, I had lived through the siege of Sarajevo, no shelling could have been as bad as that, which was like a constant bombardment. Um, a Grozny was the most terrifying thing. It was um, like uh, gunships and er anything the Russians could throw on you, they did. And I, I literally remember being in this, um, like a vegetable cellar or something with these old women. And they were saying, oh, you know, it's God's will. Inshallah, if I die tonight, I die. I, I haven't, you know, I've had a good life. And I was like, I haven't had, I haven't lived. You know, it's not time for me to go. And um, it does drive you to the point, I mean, constant, that constant shelling, shooting, fear, and you're being in a state, your whole body tenses up. You know, you're mm -hmm. like, and I would come out of these, in those days, you know, I would go for two or three months somewhere. I didn't, I didn't have a kid, so I would go. And I'd come out and my whole back would be like in a state of, from, from the tension. Um, and I just think it, at one point you need someone, whether it's a friend or a parent or a sibling, to kind of take you aside and just say, you know, you're, you're going too far down. You're going too, it's too dark where you're going. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah. So. so I want to return to the issue of sexual violence, the other thread of, well, it's, it's different for women who do these kinds of jobs. Um, what has been your experience over the arc of your career? You said that your very first assignment, you paid it no heed. Um, is, it, is there some sort of sign of the times about the free-for-all of combatants, or is it geographically? Uh, just. Again, a part of this question is um, 
is self-interested because you know we because you know changes in the glass ceiling you know we have more women correspondents the world over in places that we probably 20 30 before my time we wouldn't have sent them and but you know there were news of attacks in Rear Square any insight you can shed on how you feel about this issue um, if it's become more or less of a fear or danger in your life or other women correspondents' lives, I think would be, would be helpful. Yeah, I worked in Africa for years and years, and Africa is probably the place where um, you're, I think I felt the most vulnerable. And there was a time in the Middle East when I, I can remember talking to a, a much older female correspondent who said to me, you never, don't ever have to worry about getting raped here because they just think we're like, ugh, you know, like women, these strange creatures. And there almost was this kind of like, ugh, you know, a girl. Um, and nothing ever happened to me. And if it did, I was so ignorant of it because I basically, I was more worried about getting shot or killed than I was about getting raped. But something happened to me in the, um, the war in Kosovo, which was that I got taken, um, I wouldn't say kidnapped, because it was only five or six hours and they let us go, by a group of um, Serb paramilitaries. Uh, if anyone knows the Balkan Wars, they were the um, Frankies guys, you know, who came after Arkan, and they were paramilitaries who were really nasty. Um, and they were drunk, and that was the, the worst thing, is that they were completely drunk, and it was um, late, it was about seven o'clock at night. I was very stupid, because I was alone on this mountaintop. I wanted to talk to refugees who were crossing over. And there were two French journalists who were with me. They had been left behind, too. And um, suddenly I looked up, and there was no one there except these paramilitaries who kind of swarmed, and they, they grabbed us. And they, um, they took all our stuff, and they, um, and they started saying they were going to kill us. And I knew, even though I hadn't yet done a hostile environment course, that I had to identify the leader. Like, it wasn't going to help me to deal with these kind of the, the guys who were around. It was, I had to find who was the leader. And I very quickly worked that out, and so I tried to appeal to him. And after, they did really horrific stuff to us. I mean, they marched us into the woods, and they made us kneel down and close our eyes and put our hands up, and they started firing into the air. And the two guys I were with started crying, the cameramen, and they were just like, I have kids, don't kill me. And I was like, don't cry, don't let them see you're weak. You know, even I knew that that wouldn't appeal to them. Anyway, I'm, we managed to get away, to make a long story short. Um, we got away, and uh, we escaped, and they, the two guys said, we were sure, you know, we're really lucky to have gotten, because they were gonna rape you, and there was nothing we could do. And I, I was like, well, I didn't, you know, I thought, and then I realized, like, how stupid I was, because of course that's, you know, that would have been part of the, the deal. Um, but, that, and then a couple times in Africa, I had some really hairy experiences. But again, I've always just, I think slightly by being, not naive, but kind of like, well, this, this couldn't happen to me, you know, I'm, I'm okay. Um, and then when the Lara Logan incident happened, there was so much publicity about it. But in fact, it, it's been happening for years to local journalists and women in Egypt. And, um, in a way, by her speaking out about it, it was, it was so brave of her because it, it allowed other women to come forward and say, you know, this is what's happening. Now, I think it's, um, I don't know why it's more prevalent now than it was before. Or maybe it's that people are talking about it more, but it definitely is, there, there is a big um, obstacle being a woman. I mean, I, I would say before that it was, in some ways it was easier to work in war zones because you got access to things that maybe your guy colleagues didn't. You got to jump on helicopters when they couldn't. Um, but sometimes it, it went against you. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, women that do this, basically uh, you have to know in the back of your mind and be aware of what, what could happen and how you would react and how you would how you would try to take control of a situation like that. I mean, for me, my biggest fear is crowds because I, because of Africa, basically. And, you know, it, when there's an incident, people crowd around you. And um, that's my worst. I mean, that, and that, of course, is what happened to, to Lara Logan, mm. Tahir Square. Yeah. Um, and you can't teach that in a hostile environment course, you know, what to do in case of. Um, 
Well, yeah. you, you mentioned, I mean, we already talked about your very first assignment that you had no, so have you subsequently had conflict training courses since then over your career? I've been really lucky um, because I, I worked for the Times of London and they sent me, I think, on two or three. And, um, and then uh, someone recently sent me on a um, refresher, I can't remember who, but I, I've, I've done about three of them. I think the medical training is essential. I, I think it's, it, it can't, you know, I'm so happy that Sebastian is, is doing this because I think that, um, I have to say in some ways some of the stuff I had when I was given those courses by the SAS in, in England, some of the stuff didn't, wasn't very, you know, checkpoints, how to behave at a checkpoint. You, well, you know what to do at a checkpoint. Um, but the things about kidnapping, what to do if you're kidnapped in the first few minutes, um, the accidents, car accidents, because most, um, most damage actually happens in cars. So car crashes and the medical training, the medical training was, yeah. was really important. Yeah, I, I have also taken one of these courses and I thought, in addition to all that, the most helpful piece of info that I got was a little index card that listed the maximum effective range of various firearms. Where so no, I'm I'm serious. So if you knew that if there was a policeman who was 75 yards away and all he had was a pistol, that he was never ever ever even if he was the best pistol shot in the world, he was never ever going to hit you. So you could go the other way, uh, and you know that an AK-47 and an M14 have you know approximately 300 meters, 300 yards effective range. That was invaluable, just in sort of assessing when you are in a firefight, you know, like a soldier, that you can assess, those guys are over there, they're carrying those kinds of weapons, so we're either safe or we're not so safe. And so I'm a huge fan of these. I mean, we send our correspondents on them all the time, but they're very, very useful, because some of the thing, yeah, like how to act at a checkpoint is not so useful, but some of the very practical first aid and, you know, this is the very real accuracy difference between a pistol and a rifle is, is good info for journalists who a lot of them do not have that kind of yeah. training. I mean, they've never been in the military themselves. So, um, you know, I regret that, that Bob couldn't come because one of the things that we were going to talk about is, you know, the difference between television crews and rolling big the way that the networks roll big wherever they go. And a lot of the work that you do is not only solo, but it's undercover. Yeah. Uh, so can you talk about the unit, you know, both the perhaps the security afforded, but also the greater danger if you're, like, what's it like to work undercover? And, you know, unlike, you know, I, I remember, again, you know, when the New York Times rolls through Baghdad, you know, because they got yeah. like five up armored, gigantic. Chase cars. And, <laughs> you know? No, um, I, I couldn't. I, I, you know, I love working with photographers, especially ones I adore, but um, I, I mainly work alone because I work in, usually work in closed countries. And I, if I'm by myself, I can, it's, you know, it's not very pleasant and it's scary and it's um, lonely. But I can get so much more access. Um, and I just think that you, uh, you've you got to do a lot of research. Um, and you have to kind of, you have to know, I mean, whenever a young reporter says to me, you know, what's the first thing you say? It's that you really have to have so, done so much research before you hit the ground running somewhere. And um, I'm lucky, too, that I don't have blonde hair <laughs> because I can kind of pass in most, most countries. You know, I can, I can be an Arab, I could be Israeli, I could be Pakistani. Um, I'm pretty lucky. Africa's a bit of a stretch, but I, <laughs> I, yeah. I have in Somalia. My fixer did tell me that I looked half Somali. So <laughs> I, did, I did have a... <laughs> but I wanted to get back to the thing about the hostile environment courses, because in the incident I was talking about in Sierra Leone in 2002, where Kurt Shork and Miguel de Moreno were killed, there was two cameramen in the car with Kurt from Reuters, and both of them had just taken a hostile environment course. I think it was the first one ever offered. And they knew to run, and I can't quite work this one out, but they, they, were, they ran into an ambush, so they were going up a dirt road, and the, the soldiers shot at them from both sides, and Kurt was killed pretty much instantly. Miguel wasn't, but died later on. And the two guys who survived kicked out the window of the car they were in, and ran into the fire 
um, past the guys who were shooting. And I don't know if there's any like weapons experts here, but I remember Yanis Bekarius, who the Reuters photographer said to me, I had just taken the hostile environment course and they taught us if you're caught in a crossfire to run towards the shooting because they don't have time enough to turn around. Anyway, they both had to hide in the woods for eight hours while the rebel, the, it was the RUF, Sierra Leonean soldiers, um, tracked them in a jungle. And they basically, it was like playing hide and seek. You know, the rebels were looking for them, they were hiding under rocks. And, and they said that the reason they, um, they survived was because they had just gotten that course. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to bring that up about the importance of these courses. So let's talk a little bit about where you see the broader arc of the industry going. And because you are such a legend, you must have men and women, 22 or just out of journalism school, saying, you know, I want to do what you do. What do you tell them? I tell them that they, they, they should go for it. You know, I have a lot of colleagues that tell them, don't go into journalism, it's the absolute worst career. But I, you know, I said, look, you can go in through the front door, the side door, or the back door. And the front door is um, the traditional way. You, you go work for AP or Reuters, or you, know, you work as an unpaid intern, which most people can't afford. But, um, and then you work your way up. Or you go work on a local paper in Michigan or Maine or someplace like that. And you gradually, you know, then you work for the Providence Journal, and then you but in, this takes years and years and years, and I personally did not have the patience to do this. Um, or you can go through the side door, which is that you go somewhere like a hub now, like Beirut or Istanbul, um, and you try to pick up as many strings as you can um, and as many freelance gigs, and you just basically live in the place, learn the language, and cover the war or conflict that way. Um, and that. That basically is the back door, side door. But, um, and I think that if you do that, you must, before you go, have some training. Um, at least have worked in a local newspaper or something, just get some kind of training, some kind of medical training, and a, a good knowledge of how to work with NGOs, how to work with diplomats, how to get, you know, because it, reporting a conflict isn't just going into a bang bang region, it's reporting the whole periphery of it, you know, so you, I think in some ways, and try to latch on to um, some knowing older journalists that will take you under their wing and bring you with them. Um, I No, I mean, I think, I find it really depressing when colleagues of mine in my age group, um, young, they say to young reporters, don't do it, you know, it's, it's going, there's no, no such thing as journalism, because I think we have to pass the torch, you know, we, we have to we have to pass the baton onto the next generation. And um, on another note, I mean, I remember how awful <laughs> older women reporters were to me when I first started, and really unkind. And um, and maybe that's because then there were so few women, and mm -hmm. there really were, you know, maybe a handful. And they must have thought I was like some little puppy dog, you know, it's kind of. But they were so deeply unpleasant to me that I just made it my vow that if that, you know when I grew into my own skin, I would never do that to other women and that I would be a mentor and I'd support them. And um, I, I try to, you know, I try to, because this is a, the next generation and we have to, we have to continue doing good narrative reporting. Um, you've said, I think, several times that, you know, you're, you're realistic about the impact that you have, that you know, governments aren't going to stand down on massacre and slaughter and armed conflict because of the beauty and pathos of your stories. And all we or you really can hope to do is, is bear witness and give voice to the voiceless. So I'm wondering these days, what are some of the most voiceless people or voiceless conflicts or what, I mean, you specialize in telling undertold stories. So. There's a lot of eyes on Istanbul. There's even, I mean, this is a huge and tragic conflict in Syria, but what are some of the other regions or stories that you think are not getting even comparatively as much play as, as for example, those two stories? Poverty. I mean, I think that, um, 
I think I hate, in a way, how fickle journalism is and how, you know, it's turned to Turkey right now, but next week Syria might have a minute and then it will, you know, Mali had its moment in February, but it didn't last very long. Um, I think big issues now that, I mean, to me it's more themes, and I think that poverty, um, Africa, um, I mean, I think that there's still ongoing conflicts such as Sri Lanka that, that don't get reported, but how do you convince an editor, um, unless it's something like Granta, which is you know, very rare, that will let you go report what's happening in Sri Lanka or the aftermath of a genocide or a conflict? Um, it's, you know, in a way, you can't blame the journalists or the editors because it's really readers. Um, you know, CNN does, tries to make a stab at doing, you know, Africa Journal or something like that, whatever it's called, once a week and showing stories from the continent and, um, or focusing on Pakistan. Or, Pakistan's a really important story. Afghanistan's been left behind. Yeah. Iraq's been left behind. I mean, it, once in a while you get something about, you know, 20 people died in Baghdad today, but um, I think the Palestinian story is still, has been so neglected. Um, in a sense, because it's been going on for so long that there's been no, no new development, um, just a stalled peace process. Mm -hmm. And so people don't want to read about it, don't want to see it on television. And I really respect reporters that keep going with a certain region and keep, keep it in the public eye. Um, but I would say if you ask me like my top three, I'd say, yeah, Palestine, definitely. Mm -hmm. Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. Afghanistan's a forgotten story now. Yeah. Um, so I, I think we're right on schedule. We're right at nine o'clock, which is when we're supposed to um, open the floor up to audience questions. I don't, I'm not sure where is that the uh, the. So. I guess we'll just do this. Oh, hello. I have a question for uh, Jim Frederick of okay. Time Magazine. <laughs> Thank you. It's just teasing. So. Can you tell us a little bit about your book and uh, how did you come to write it? The, the, um, the book about... Uh, yeah. yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, my book is called Black Hearts, One Platoon's Descent into Madness in Iraq's Triangle of Death. And it's basically a day-by-day -day reconstruction of a company, or more specifically, a platoon. So that's about 40 men. It's an infantry unit, so it's all men, uh, who were stationed to a place called the Triangle of Death, uh, which is about 30 miles south of Baghdad in 2005 and 2006. Um, from the 101st Airborne Division, and so it was the group of men who were, who were stationed in arguably Iraq's most dangerous place at its most dangerous time. And the real climax and, and reason that this group came to my attention was because four of these 40 men uh, raped a 14-year-old Iraqi girl, killed her, her six-year-old sister, and her parents. And for months, they effectively covered it up as Iraq uh, Iraqi on Iraqi violence, and the true nature of the crime only came out after uh, a whistleblower came forward whose conscience was, he didn't commit the crime, but everybody tell, you know, somebody told somebody who told somebody, and it all came out. And so I was just interested in the horrific nature of this crime because it was, up to that time, it was one of the worst known war crimes committed by American soldiers in that conflict up till that date. And I originally just wanted to tell the story of, well, you know, how do American men do the unthinkable, the crucible of war, you know, so stories as old as Achilles and, and, you know, just sort of the horrible things that men do during wartime. And what I discovered in reconstructing their unit story over the year was actually the Army's narrative of how this went down was these were four bad apples. Criminals exist in every culture and every subculture. We had no way of knowing. This just happened. They went berserk. We couldn't have known. It was actually that this unit was probably what's known as combat ineffective, and the Army had known that for months. And there was red flag after red flag after red flag that 
all the way up to company commander, battalion commander, brigade command, had either been unable or unwilling to recognize, diagnose, and get that unit out of there. And so it turned from a story about a true crime story that happened to take place in a war zone to becoming a story about failed leadership and not to absolve the four men that committed the crime, but to say that there were much larger political and military forces at work that set up a situation where it would be conceivable that a crime like this could take place. And so I had done a lot of military reporting in you know, just a lot of my assignments, and I was in Tokyo for four years, and a lot of the news that interested American readers was when Marines in Okinawa did stupid stuff and, you know, would hold up a liquor store, even though they're the only Americans on this entire island. Just um, So I would do these military stories, and I got to know these military lawyers. And I basically had a, a whistleblower in my midst where one of the defense lawyers who was assigned to these four guys called me in Tokyo. He was in Baghdad. He'd been assigned to defend these guys. And he's like, you need to tell the, the broader story of what happened in Bravo Company because I think, <laughs> I think the lawyer probably broke a confidentiality when he's like, my guy is guilty. He is guilty, guilty, guilty. <laughs> Um, but there's a lot more to this story than just four bad apples. And so that just kicked off three years of research, two trips to Iraq, trying to reconstruct what happened to this unit. And, um, and what was you know, probably most gratifying was I was fully prepared for this book to be discredited, to be smeared by the military and the government, and to be called anti-American and anti-army. Um, and for an organization that disappoints me consistently, uh, in this capacity, the Army's actually been incredibly mature and has taken this as a learning opportunity, and they've embraced it, and it's assigned at West Point, and I go up to West Point to talk about leadership and lessons of the book, and they invite me to Fort Benning, and that has been the biggest surprise because I was certain that I was going to be persona non grata of the United States military, and for some bizarre reason, they like the book and they like me, and I don't know why. Um, so that's, um, that's what Black Hearts is about. Um, so. I, uh, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, this means a lot to me. I actually served in Afghanistan in 2010 as a, as a Marine, so I appreciated that you mentioned Afghanistan as an underreported area in the world. It was actually a documentary I saw uh, recently on Vice, Mag Vice, Vice Magazine's, what, or Vev, whatever the name of the, yeah, right, and it was by uh, Ben Ferguson, I believe was the name of the reporter. Ben it was Anderson? a three-part, right. Was it Ben Anderson, maybe? Maybe Ben Anderson. Yeah. And it was probably the most impressive uh, reporting that I had seen, and it really related to my own experience. It was actually in the Helmand province where I served. It was actually in the exact districts where I served. And all the Marines I served with, I sent it to them, and I posted it on Facebook, and we all responded the same way. We thought it was unbelievable. Um, and I expected a reaction of some sort from the, you know, what we call the mainstream media, and there was nothing. Um, I'm just curious if you can talk about... Uh, what did he, he wrote about Helmand, and in what, in what way did he... Because I didn't read the piece. It, um, I mean, he, he talked about a lot of different elements, but he was basically um, in, in Sangin, uh, and Musa Kala, I and I think he was there for eight years total. He was there for a really long time, so he, he knew the area pretty well as far as reporters eight years go. Years in Sangin. Right, wow. right. Well, it was <laughs> right. I mean, I don't know. He, he was in that general region yeah. of Helmand, um, but he was in Sangin when it was really starting to go hot. Um, and I, I was just, I just wanted to ask you if you could get a little more in the weeds as far as the relationship between these kind of newer forms of war, war journalism that you're seeing online uh, and its relationship with mainstream media, is how, how it's influencing it. Do you see hope in, in this, kind of, this kind of more an anarchic uh, way of doing journalism, or are you worried about it? Um, that's, that's my question. Thank you. I, I mean, what worries me more is um, at one point, right in the beginning of the um, Arab Spring, I saw a lot of my colleagues using Twitter as, as a news source. Um, and that was 
deeply worrying to me. They were using it the way that you would, in the old days, you would use the AP or the Reuters wire. And they were kind of scrolling, going, ah, oh, there's a demonstration here that in this. And I think blogs scare me slightly to be used as gospel because they're not checked. Um, and as much as it's annoying for me, you know, I just did a piece for Vanity Fair. I work for Vanity, I'm an editor of Vanity Fair. And I, going through the fact checking is a nightmare. But at least there is some kind of, um, there's someone making sure that, you know, it's everything fits together. Um, I think that these magazines like Vice, I mean, in a sense, they're great because they're giving, they're giving long format and they're also letting photographers do projects. But um, I don't know if they're ever going to be a threat to mainstream journalism because there'll always be people that are unaware of them and won't read them, that are, are always going to read Time or Newsweek or, um, I don't know, you're an editor. You probably have a more. Yeah, I, uh, I have a couple of thoughts on that. I mean, I, I agree completely. I think that Twitter is an incredible tool. Um, but like a hammer it can, or a gun, you know, it can be used for good or for ill. Uh, and I think we haven't really seen, there's a lot of naivete when it comes to the use and abuse of Twitter. And I think that there's absolutely an opportunity, you know, for um, despotic regimes to use Facebook and Twitter to either send out false information or reprisals for those who, you know, we're going to have a spontaneous flash mob demonstration at XYZ Square and it's actually a sock puppet account where it's really the secret police are then going to round up all the people that show up for that particular um, demonstration. And um, I think that Vice uh, is, not just because they're across the street, and there might even be some people uh, in the room, uh, is really an extraordinary publication and an extraordinary, um, it's even dismissive to call it an experiment, uh, a new voice in a new kind of journalism um, that m might not you know, take over the rest of mainstream media. But I think one of the things that they're doing very effectively is that people like Janine and I, we, we despair that, oh, People don't care about these stories. Um, people don't, aren't, aren't reading about international news in quite the same way that they were before. I think Vice has fine-tuned the dial pretty precisely in finding ways to hook into an emotional component that people can identify with, that makes that story interesting to them. I mean, I think you know, the new TV show on HBO is great. I mean, I think there are certain excesses. You know, there's certain things that Shane does that a time journalist is never going to do. And like, that's okay. Uh, but I think, you know, it's now a couple of years. I think the, 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 the Baghdad heavy metal band is sort of the best example that I know of, of how do you take the failing state, failing city of Baghdad, the, another car bomb goes off and 20 people die and nobody cares, to actually turn that into a story of, well, what is it like to be in a heavy metal band in Baghdad in 2006? It's freaking crazy uh, and really complicated. And uh, it's an extraordinary example of there are new, unique, and interesting ways to tell stories that are very much in the old line, main line, journalistic tradition, but also give it a fresh spin in a way that, I mean, I hate to be such a fuddy-duddy about this, that like my 20-year-old nephew who's in college is going to read that story, and he's not going to read the story in time. He's just not going to. And so that's great. And there are things that Time and Vanity Fair can learn from that. At the same time, I do think that there's a large community of people who are interested in international news and foreign relations who are not interested in the Vice story. But that's OK, too. Um, so there's a lot to learn there. And I'm not just saying it because they're across the street and they've been nice to me in the past. Vice is a force to be reckoned with. And they are doing a lot of right stuff, in my opinion. Also, when you think about it, um, I don't know if anyone's ever read those Vietnam War books like um, Dispatches by Michael Hare or Tim O'Brien, If I Died in a Combat Zone, If I Die in a Combat Zone, or the things they carried. Those books at the time were incredibly radical. I mean, yeah. Dispatches was thought of as a sort of 
a major departure from the way that the New York Times was reporting the Vietnam War. People like Gloria Emerson or, were, were writing about it. So, and then I do, I remember distinctly there were people that used that Michael Hare style of war reporting um, and carried it into the, like Anthony Lloyd um, uh, of the Times of London, who's a, a great um, war reporter, he's a former soldier. Um, so I think, you know, I think it's every generation and every conflict has someone who kind of breaks the mold and needs to be shaken up a bit. And maybe that's what Vice is doing. Hi, uh, my name is Anna Triste, and I'm an independent journalist. And I'm also on the founding board of uh, Frontline Freelance Registry, which is a body for journalists uh, by conflict journalists that launched last week. Um, so Janine, it's very exciting to have you here. And thanks for supporting Risk um, as a young woman. I've been hearing about you from, mentor from mentors of mine for years. Um, but my question is actually for you, uh, Jim. Um, so. I'm on the other end of emails with people who are in your position. And unfortunately, in my experience and the experience of my colleagues, um, we often deal with uh, editors and producers who are cavalier with our safety, particularly in Syria. Um, however, I also have editors who I can like, feel the shame in their emails when they write back, again, saying that they're not going to pay for our health insurance, emergency evacuation, hostile environment training, or even pay us a decent wage. Um, so what's the conversation that's <laughs> happening from, I'm going to assume you're in the camp of the latter um, with your company about uh, the situation and hiring freelancers and treating us um, as professionals? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, time is really the only place that I've ever worked. Um, so I don't, I can't really speak to how other news organizations are treating freelancers. Um, I'm happy to talk to any time freelancers who might feel like they're getting the short end of the stick. Um, but yeah, I mean, we have a global network of contributors and stringers, some of whom are on contract, some of whom we pay per, the piece, per piece. Um, you know, one of the untold stories, you know, the, the underbellies of journalism is, you know, local reporters and local stringers, um, they get used and abused much more than American or Western European freelancers do. And I mean, I think that's one of the great untold stories is, you know, even in when, you know, American journalists get kidnapped or killed, Maybe their fixer or their translator is even mentioned. Very often their fixer, fixer or translator is not. And, you know, these are men and women who not only um, go through the same risks, they go through more risks um, because, you know, they suffer from the potential of political or neighbor harassment or danger or reprisals that an American or British or German passport affords you a ton of diplomatic or just don't mess with me immunity from all kinds of crazy policemen or, or more to your point. Um, I think that the, the entire traditional structures, pay structures, um, the notion that people work for websites for free or are willing to um, is, you know, a 10-year new phenomenon. Um, I will confess that time entertains the notion in a way that it would never have entertained the notion previously. Uh, not to point fingers or name names, but I mean, the Huffington Post just opened the flood wall, the, the floodgates on this, where you have organizations that are not just not paying your health insurance, but are saying that you should give us content for free. I, because I'm a company man, and I actually think that uh, in an industry where all are implicated uh, and finances are not good all the way around, um, time comports itself with a measure of integrity that a lot of places don't. But I don't have an answer for the industry as a whole. All I will say, the only saving grace here, is that there are more outlets and there are more opportunities than there ever were before. And to her advice, I mean, unfortunately, rather than having, you know, 
fast nickels are the same as slow dimes. You know, you probably need three or four strings at a time where before one string would do. And that's just the new nature of the industry because I know that time is competing with 200 organizations that didn't exist even 15 years ago. So I'm really not trying to duck your question. All I can say is that it's, it's tough out there. I'm not trying to hide behind gigantic you know, Time Warner saying we don't have any money, but um, times are tough on the executive side, on the business of these news organizations, and I know that times are tough for the freelancers themselves. And it's hard, yeah, it's, it's really crappy sending those emails to saying, you know, we can't pay you the day rate of $500 that we used to, will you take 200? And some people do. Um, and so, you know, what you have is, and you know, we could go on and on about this. Uh, I mean, you were saying something about the bang bang, and you know, one of the downsides of total information awareness and Twitter and Vine and is that the bang bang, there's so much of even the international news business that is completely commoditized away that just being present, just being having a working video camera at the scene, well, we had that footage six hours ago. And so now what, where the value lies is the analysis, the separating the fog of war from what's actually happening. Um, and that next level, which is a pretty rare echelon, um, like my colleague here, uh, you know, people make livings doing that. But showing up with a video camera anymore is not, I mean, I hate to say that, like it's all, it's, it's be, being an eyewitness anymore is not automatically mean you're a journalist. There has to be a certain narrative arc to it and a storytelling aspect to it because we got eyewitnesses everywhere all the time. Hi, Janine, my question is for you. Um, so you spoke about the hostile environment courses and also about how the risks are different for men and women uh, in terms of foreign correspondence. Do the hostile environment courses take those differences into account? In other words, is there a portion of them that are geared toward women correspondence in particular? And also, uh, how important, I think you sort of spoke to this, but how important do you think these courses are? And do you think that major news organizations that are sending people out into the field have a responsibility to ensure that they get these courses before they're sent out, especially in places like Syria, which I would think in particular there'd be difference in, differences in risk between men and women. Well, I was the last one I did, which I think was taught by AKE or one of those guys out in Hereford, England, um, there was actually something really shocking. They gave, um, on my course, I think there was three women. There was maybe 20 of us and there were three women. And they gave a separate little paper to us, like rather sheepishly, the last day. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's taught by these ex SAS guys. So they're all, and they basically hate journalists, <laughs> but they, they have to give the course. And the, the sheet was like, it said something like for, for women correspondents. And it said, um, if possible, do not have sexual relations with locals. And I remember like raising my hand and going, um, but it's okay for a guy correspondent to like have an affair with his fixer, but you know, we can't. And he got, like, the guy got really like flustered. It was like, well, we had to say something like this. But, I was, like, but they, didn't, they didn't write that for the men. It was just for the women correspondents. And then they had some other stuff like very embarrassingly about like female hygiene and stuff like that. And his, it, it just made me realize how prehistoric they are. Like they just don't, as much as we've come, as far as we've come, they are still, it really is still a sexist business. Um, deep down, I think either, you know, either you get TV presenters that are very pretty and they look good and it's kind of cool to have a chick um, war correspondent who looks great and has decolletage in, in a war zone, or you get, you know, really women who are, are really tough and basically give up their lives to do this. And um, I don't think the theme, I don't think the hostile environment courses address it other than, than that. Um, and the other part of your question, are they worth it? Yes, for, for the medical for the medical part of it, absolutely. Um, I don't know if I would ever be able to do some of that stuff, but I think under pressure, I, I at least I know how to do it. Um, and it, it is very useful. It's just it's very unfortunate that it's so expensive. 
So that's why organizations like this are so fantastic that, you know, create a niche like that. So actually this question and answer set me up pretty well for my question, so thanks for that. But um, I work in global security for Thomson Reuters, and so part of my job is making sure that you can do yours and providing t courses like what you're talking about. So you touched upon this a little bit, but what's missing from the courses, right? It's, you know, along, across a lot of these large news agencies, these courses are provided at least for the salaried staff. What's not, you, you know, you're talking about female-specific training or taking into account uh, female issues. What other things might we be focusing on? Psychological, um, some kind of psychological preparation might be yeah. useful. I, I guess, you know, my experience of these courses is, yeah, the Hereford X SAS guys where I don't even know how much it costs, but it's a week and you have to bunk in at this I mean, it's not like five star, but it's a very comfortable pub slash inn, and it's very posh, it's, you know, very clubby, and all the food is excellent. If, talk about dis disruptive, if somebody could come in and do really effective day courses for very reasonable rates, and it doesn't have all the trappings of, you know, all lieutenant major SAS, not to disparage them in the slightest, I don't even want to go to that track. I mean, those guys are great, but um, there does seem to be that it is a high-end program or not at all. And so it seems like there is a market for freelancers who are paying, and I mean, I think this is, you know, this is not a public service announcement for risk, but it seems like that is the niche that risk is trying to fill, where freelancers more than ever have to do this on their own. They don't have six grand to pay for a wonderful week at a spa town in, you know, almost basically Wales. I, I just think, you know, meeting the need at a more realistic price point and a course that doesn't necessarily take five days and nights is, is, is what, as both an editor and a journalist is what I would want. Because to your freelancer question, it is, we would, we would have more people on our stringer list and more people on our contributor list if we felt and would be able to insure them, not just personal insurance, but you know, casualty insurance. In order to add them to our roles, they have to have taken one of these courses. And man, we're not spending five grand on that, you know, unless you are a, you know, it's very small correspondent core that gets that course. I guess we'd have to also talk to the insurance company about whether they would expect they would accept a one day course, but that's that that's the market to fill. Good idea. Mm. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Verena and I work as a photo editor at Cibo Press. And uh, having worked with war photographers, uh, I would like to ask you if you can talk a little bit about your relationship or your work with photographers and when you're in assignments and yeah. Um, it's really important for me working with photographers because I, I love photography. I, um, I believe that you, the kind of stories I do, which are basically long projects, I need someone to be, to witness it with photography. Um, about 10 years ago, the Times gave me a, a Nikon camera and they gave it to all the reporters and they said, okay, now you guys have to take pictures of whatever you do. And I said, no, because first of all, I think that um, it's impossible for me to focus on words and writing and interviewing and take pictures at the same time. I think it's two different sides of the brain. And I think it puts photographers out of a job. And I think it's a hugely important part of my work, my projects, the things I do. Um, I tend to have very close relationships with the people I work with, mainly because you're, you're in such a strange environment. You become very close and you also, um, you have a, a goal you're trying to reach, so you're going for it together. Um, very rare, I mean, I, I can't think in the 20 years I've been working of ever having, working with someone that I didn't get on with. I think once, um, and it was someone, he, he ceased being a photographer, not because of me, but he didn't, he didn't really have the stomach for it, I think. No, I, I, I have huge respect for photographers, and for them right now, I think it's an even harder market than it is for writers. Um, I'm very competitive, and women, um, I think that 
female photographers are really, I mean, even there's more writers than there are female photographers, female camera women. Um, there, so I have a huge amount of respect for them because I think it's a, a very tough job. And the women that I do work with, like Nicole, are you know, real professionals and I am very honored to work with them. Janine and Jim, thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Jennifer Karchmer. I'm an independent journalist based in Seattle. I'm actually just back from Iceland studying freedom of the press, so obviously a much different environment. I wanted to ask both of you, or each of you, specifically about languages and also as an American, possibly working with others from other nationalities, how you've been treated either differently, better or worse, but also what is your training in terms of languages? How has that been either a challenge or you know, how have you hired either fixers and other folks? Um, I'm an American, I speak English, a little bit of French, but I feel like I'm often at a disadvantage. Do you mind speaking on any of those points? And thank you again. Um, yeah, sure. I, um, <clears throat> I worked in Japan and England, but did a lot of reporting throughout Europe um, and make no, uh, you know, uh, just abject apology that I speak nothing other than English and I don't even speak English very well. Uh, but, and, you know, I've been fortunate that there is, you know, there's, it's not really an underground economy, it's an economy that there is an industry in every country who are dedicated to taking care of that need, that you know, it's a right-hand person. Um, through the grapevine, you can find these people because for the most of the time uh, I, I've worked at time, um, it's in a much more official capacity. Those people are either on staff or on contract. Um, you know, I, I'm not trying to make, uh, excuses for not being multilingual, but at the other, you know, in Japan, for example, um, it's fine to be conversational, but when you're going to interview government ministers, I mean, if you're not fluent, being intermediate or advanced is almost as useless as not speaking a word. And I know that sounds like I'm taking refuge in my own ignorance, but, um, you know, and there are journalists who double down on, you know, I'm going to be a Japan journalist for my entire career. And, you know, there are men and women who have been there doing that for 25 years. I've always had more of a generalist bent and a generalist streak. And, you know, we employ a couple of people who are truly native fluent in Arabic, and that's great for them. We also have people who don't speak a word of Arabic. And if you read their stories side by side, I'm not sure how apparent it would be to you which one is the fluent speaker and which one is not. So I think knowledge is always better than ignorance, but my ignorance hasn't gotten me in too much way, you know? It's like I've, so I think, yeah, it'd be great if people spoke more, Americans spoke more languages, but um, on the other hand, somehow it made it work. <laughs> I remember during the East Timor conflict, um, the Guardian correspondent, I said to him, you know, can you give me a fill on what's happening? And he looked at me and said, how's your Indonesian? <laughs> he was like a local guy who had lived and worked there. So, he, you know, I didn't have a word of Indonesian. But um, no, I think you, you, we manage. I mean, I don't speak Chechen. I didn't speak serbo croat I don't speak Arabic. Um, you, you know, of course, it's much better to have it. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be a great reporter either. Um, and personally, my fixers, my translators, are really important parts of my story because they're usually my guides into, here's a great story, let's go look at this, let's go look at that. So it's not a complete deterrent, I think, to you. Hi, my name is Caroline. I am actually heading into social work and really interested in the psychology of uh, soldiers before, during, after conflict. Um, and I have a friend who has been working for the AP and living in Afghanistan for several years and recently did a series of interviews with um, soldiers who were in a firefight and consequently um, talked about their mental preparation. I mean, literally the psychological preparation, whether it was helpful um, having preparation before, having um, some kind of, you know, intervention during 
Um, so in between firefights and then and then after and and um, so I'm interested in hearing your perspective on what that has been like, you know, for some of the military that you've spoken to, but also for journalists. Is it useful to, um, you know, have a, a discussion about mental health while you know while you're in a region that is in conflict, or is it you know is it better to decompress after? What what's the sort of and, and what is actually happening right now? You know, how is it being handled? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, it's, I mean, we could we could have a whole session and a whole yeah. discussion about mental health in the military. Um, my understanding, you know, the unit that I covered and when I was embedded. And the psychiatric core of the army is, again, I mean, it can be a completely separate story. Uh, so it's not like, oh, well, then everything's great. But there are psychiatrists and psychologists attached to most units. And after major incidents, IEDs, firefights, there's what's known as a major incident debrief, yeah. where the psychiatrist or psychologist in even the hottest war zones are made available to soldiers to talk to them in groups and individually. Now, soldiers themselves are all over the map in terms of whether or not this is useful at all. Some of them will say that it really, really, ha you know, and like so many things, I think it depends on that particular psychologist or psychiatrist. Um, some of them will say that it's really, really helpful. Other than others will say that they just give you an ambient and tell you to, you know, suck it up, soldier, and get back out there. So. I think it's really all over the map, and whether in country, in conflict, I do think that there at least theoretically is an awareness that this is important. Whether or not the military is capable of providing the kind of care they say is important, at least they say it's important. Um, whether or not they can muster the reservist psychiatrists after 10 years of constant war who are willing and able to go cater to these soldiers when they need them is a completely different story. Um, but I think one of the misperceptions is that the Army pays no heed to this issue. They do. Um, just like the VA, which again is a completely different issue and we could have a whole session about that. They know these problems exist and I'm actually pretty sympathetic about them having the apparatus or the ability to get them done. I mean, there's much more of an awareness of this as a problem as an ability to do something. Um, but yeah, those, it's called a major incident debrief and it happens after every major incident. Um, it's debatable about how helpful or effective those debriefs are. So. And in terms of journalists, is that the same? I mean, is, it, is there a similar sort of, I mean, what kind of structure is there for journalists? I guess I'm curious because you brought it up earlier. Uh, a very, <laughs> a very, very minimal one, yeah. if any at all. Um, what happens is, and the industry is culpable here, when somebody comes back from a tour or a long tour, you go to lunch or drinks or maybe a even a conversation in the office where at one point the editor will turn to you and be like, so how you doing? And that's it, you know? And if the person says, I'm not doing well, then we arrange, you know, some help. But I'm being as honest with you as I can. In my experience, that's pretty much the size of it. Thank you. Am I wrong? Yeah, absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. Hi, I'm Nick. Um, I'm a Harper's intern now, but I uh, used to work at a newspaper that was pretty near Fort Campbell, which is one of the big army bases. It's on the Kentucky-Tennessee border. Um, and, you know, when I was there, I was always sort of interested in war correspondence, but I just couldn't abide the thought of being like a military beat reporter because, um, like, you know, y your whole toolkit of like open records laws and open meetings laws and all of the things that you can use to sort of hold officials accountable, those didn't really seem to apply in the military beat. It was, it was like, you're so dependent on what the public affairs officers wanted to tell you. I, I mean, that's oversimplifying, I know, but um, like, um, I, I think that probably a lot of people who are drawn to war correspondence, a lot of journalists in general for that matter, have a distaste for like, um, the interior interior culture of the military of the U.S. Army, um, and so I'm curious. It, it sounds like both of you have some experience, um, like 
maybe if not being embedded exactly, then dealing with the military from that side. I'm curious about what you think about um, embedded, you know, what, what it's like to work as an embedded reporter and what it's like to go that route of, as opposed to like going to Beirut or wherever to start here as a beat reporter and work from the side of the U.S. Army. Well, I mean, I think that we embed it before um, the war in Iraq and Afghanistan made it virtually impossible to report unless you were embedded. Um, I mean, I'm thinking of, you know, being in places like Africa or Kosovo where in order to get the story, you'd have to tag along with a, a unit of rebel fighters. Um, and I think that um, the, the first time that I've had bad experiences embedding with the American military, and then I've had very good experiences as well. Um, I'm not by nature someone that's a good, um, I'm more of a rebel, so I don't like being told what to do. Um, but I remember being in, in Sangin, actually, someone was talking about Sangin, in Helmand province in Afghanistan with group, a British, a small British unit, and they were just getting their asses kicked. And it was, you know, Sangin is the bloodiest place in all of Afghanistan, or it was. And the day I arrived, there was a funeral for two 18-year-old soldiers. And they were basically, every time they'd go on patrol, they'd lose a guy. So in a way, to be able to, to cover that was quite extraordinary. And that was the first time I ever had to go through a censor. And the censor basically, all he did, um, I can't remember what the Americans did, but the British censors read your copy only for location and to make sure that you weren't going to put the soldiers themselves in any kind of danger. But basically, I could say whatever I wanted to. Um, it's not, embedding is not my chosen form of reporting a conflict. Um, but I mean, in Iraq and Afghanistan, that was, Afghanistan, you couldn't report unless you were embedded, right? I'm yeah, pretty sure I, you couldn't. I mean, it's a great question. It's a complicated question. Again, we could have a whole session about this. Um, <clears throat> I generally only used embeds when it was, literally and physically impossible to go to the place. And you know, we had, time had a house in Baghdad, in the red zone, uh, and we had local Iraqi staff, and we trusted them with our lives and their judgment about where you could go and where you could not go safely, and we traveled with two um, soft skin cars wherever we went. You know, we were completely incognito, no armored up anything. And the only time we went on embeds is when our local Iraqi staff is like, we wouldn't go there. Like, we're not, we're not going to that, I'm not, we're not going there. And so in zones that are that hot, we would do the embed. Because we would, all things being equal, we would prefer not to embed with the US Army. We would rather you know, interview them from the outside. Because I would say embedded in your question is the, the influence is more insidious than you describe. Again. I never had any issues with being censored. I'm not even sure the PAO read my copy. I mean, I think they were, they were in a war zone and you know, they were doing other stuff. And the last thing that they were doing was actually keeping track of what I was doing on any given day. Um, I mean, the soldiers were, but the PAO weren't. I mean, they weren't, they weren't there, it was too hot. Uh, the influence that's a little bit more insidious is that you are as dependent on this organization for your safety as a child is to a parent. So the Stockholm Syndrome-esque you know, identification with them as, you know, God, I love you guys because you keep me safe. Uh, that is a little bit, you always need to be on guard for that. That am I really down with the program because these guys are kicking ass and taking names and keeping me from the bad guys? That, but you always need to be conscious of that. Um, in my opinion. And then I will just say, because I think we're probably running out of time, we probably have one more question and then we have to, um, is that, um, you know, I, I knew people who were, I don't want to use this word scared, but preferred to do all embeds because they didn't really actually, even though they said that they were war journalists, they didn't actually like interacting with the locals. Uh, and then there were people who were the opposite, who were so on guard for this influence that I never do embeds. I don't want to talk to the military. I want to talk to the people. And that to me is like, everybody's got a story. You know, even the US Army and the sergeant who's just trying to get through the day, 
like he's got a story that's as valid as anybody else's story. And so to try to get over those biases, I personally, I always thought were important because I knew two, you know, I knew people who looked at it from both sides. I just tried to talk to everybody, you know. Um, so, so I guess we have one more question, then we need to wrap up. Okay. Hi. Um, Chris Hedges' book, War is a Force, that gives us meaning, talks a lot about the importance of war correspondence in shaping the narrative of a conflict. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about the challenges of adjusting that narrative once it's been established? For instance, much of the reporting in the 90s during the conflict in the Balkans painted the war in broad strokes where the Serbs were the bad guys, the Croats were the good guys, and the Bosnians were the victims. However, the reality was obviously much more complex than that. Um, any sort of... Um, well, the, the war in Bosnia was so complicated that I remember, you know, one of the veteran Kurt Shork saying, if you begin to understand what's going on here, <laughs> you're wrong. So the moment you felt like you knew it was happening, you, you got it wrong. It was so incredibly complicated that to try to bring this story to the public was even, was an enormous challenge. Um, I don't think it was as simplistic as the Serbs are bad guys, the, the Bosnian Muslim, the Bosniaks are good guys, the Croats are worse than the Serbs, but um, in a sense, it was a very different conflict than Syria, where really both sides have, um, have a lot to answer for. Um, in Bosnia, you did have a situation where there were victims and there were aggressors, and, and there were, was a civilian population that was being pounded and that had an arms embargo against it. So that point, I think, was something that reporters grabbed onto. The other thing is that we were living in the city, in the place, which was getting pounded. So in a sense, they weren't just pounding the Sarajevans, they were pounding us as well. Um, and I think people became very emotionally attached to that story in a way that I've never really experienced again. Um, the, the whole generation that reported the, the Bosnian War um, it was touched by it in an in, in extraordinary way. Um, and I'm not sure, I wish I could answer it. I've, I've had long discussions with, with my colleagues about it. Um, I think it, it was partially that it was, it was our generation's Vietnam. And it was something, it was really a, a last chance for Europe and the international community to do something right. And they failed. Um, so that was partially it. But I guess maybe my question's a little bit larger than just that conflict. It's, it's more of, you know, once that narrative starts to become established, whatever that narrative is, how difficult is it to say, oh, wait a second, maybe it's not as black and white as, as we're sort of presenting it to be? Well, I mean, Syria, you have that now in a sense that it's, you know, people think the rebels are good guys and the government is complete, you know, and it is, I think it, you know, people who do take a stand and say, okay, well, let's look at some war crimes that the rebels are committing are, you know, it, it's a difficult picture to paint, um, to take that sort of, then you're labeled as pro-government and you've got a complete um, other issues to deal with. So I, I don't know quite how you turn a narrative around. Yeah, um, I mean, I think, I think it's the biggest problem there is. I mean, as a card-carrying member of the mainstream media, I think one of the biggest problems is the dominant narrative takes over and competition among these news outlets are, to follow what everybody perceives the big story to be and just to reinforce it and reinforce it. And you know, a variation of this is, well, for a little while it was Mali. And everybody was all hot on Mali for a little while, but then we moved over to Turkey and now we're doing Snowden and Bob Woodruff couldn't be here because he had to be with the rest of the mainstream media in Hong Kong because that's what we're talking about right now. So as, again, a card-carrying member, but also as a news consumer, I'd say look out for the outlets that zig when everybody else zags and those are the ones doing really interesting work and you know have a uh, a uh, you know a certain integrity of their own outlook and those are you know as a as a news consumer those are the, the people that you know at times I respect and admire the most the dominant narrative is a big problem um. Thank you so much, Janine and Jim. This has been a really amazing discussion. I think if I didn't stand up, people would have asked questions all night. 
Uh, my name is Lily Hindi. I'm the Deputy Director of Risk, and I want to thank you all so much for coming out and for buying tickets. The proceeds from ticket sales go to help us train more journalists in first aid. We have another training next week up in the Bronx, and um, after we do that, we'll have trained about 100 freelancers in first aid and sent them all back with these little medical kits. <laughs>